I'm Molly Bloom. Do you know about me? I'm getting that you don't think much of me, but what if every single one of your ill-informed, unsophisticated opinions about me were wrong? So it's January 1st, okay? We're back, we're relaxing. We go to watch a movie that night, January 1st, 2018. We watch this movie called Molly's Game, okay? And I leave. I am so fascinated by this story that I said, I gotta find out who this girl is. So I go on Twitter, I find her, I tweet her at 10.44 p.m. I get a message two days later, we go back and forth, and here we are sitting down with Molly in Colorado. Thank you for taking the time yeah. and visiting with us. Thank you for coming to Colorado. So Molly, you are known as the Poker Princess. That's that's the nickname, they get you, right? Yes, you ran this business, they call it a $100 million business. You ran, you had all these people that were coming, the biggest poker game in America, quarter million dollar buy-in. Uh, how did this whole thing get started? I mean, how did you go from who you were at? Were you playing poker at six years old, eight years old with daddy? Tell us that part of the story. It was really sort of an accident. My life plan was to go to the Olympics. I skied for the US ski team. I was a very serious student and I had just taken the LSAT and done incredibly well. I was in the process of applying to law schools when kind of a fluke accident happened on my Olympic qualifier run. I literally tripped on a stick, a pine bough inserted itself into my binding and my ski pre-released. I was really injured and that was the end of my ski career and it sort of it sort of made me question everything that I was doing and so I wanted to take a little bit of time to really think that through, to think if this life plan was what I wanted to do. So I went to LA, I got a bunch of jobs, I was a cocktail waitress, I was a, you know, a personal assistant, and my boss at the time said, you know, I'm gonna need you to serve drinks to my poker game. And I remember Googling like what kind of music do poker players like to listen to and like trying to understand them as a species because I had zero exposure. Never. Not you've never I'd never played a hand of poker. The only time I had seen anyone playing poker was on the movies that mm -hmm. in the movies that we've all seen. And I'm just like, what? You know, what am I walking into? And so when I showed up at the game, really quickly I realized um, this was not what I thought it was. I walk in the room and some of the most famous, wealthy, and powerful men are seated around this table. That night? That night. So your first night, you yeah. go there, you're seeing everybody there? Yes. In that moment, I was like, light bulb moment, this is an incredible way to build a network. Uh, this is not an opportunity that, you know, a 22-year-old girl from Loveland, Colorado generally gets. And then also, they're speaking freely, and I'm like, this is access to people, this is access to information. And then at the end of the night, I made three thousand dollars which at that time was a you know a, a, a night yeah I mean at that time and now again yes I would be ecstatic right now so I learned the game I learned as much as I could about the game I studied the, the, the guys for you know six months to kind of understand what the draw was here how I could turn this into a business for when myself. When you say study, what do you mean by study? I watched so you study the way they were playing or yeah. are you doing research about them? What? Both. So I'm learning all the terminology so that I don't seem like an amateur. Got it. You know, and I'm learning um, how to talk shop with them. And then I'm sort of observing them. I realized a couple things. First of all, these guys didn't, they didn't want things anymore, right? They could they buy all the it. things that yeah. they want. They wanted experiences. Mm. And, and this, gambling, it really took them outside of themselves. It was escapism. So it was this experience, this transformational experience, this, this you know, escapism. And so when I ultimately took over the game, the first thing I did was I built on that. You know, I built on like, these guys want to feel like James Bond for a night. They want to be different when they walk out of this room than they were when they walked So in. you made them feel like James Bond for a night? I tried, yeah. That's so, now some of the names, the names are out. Every, yeah, you know, right? The names yeah. are out, so you know, uh, one of the uh, players, Ruderman, ends up having a Ponzi scheme from trying to get investments from other people, and he uh, came out and told everybody. I think Toby McGuire's on that list, Leonardo DiCaprio's on that list, Ben Affleck's on that list, I think A Rod's on that list, Alex Rodriguez, and there's a few other guys that came out on that list. So now you have all these personalities. Yes. You're 25. Uh, the one part that I watch, and I really want to get into the relationship with your father, that whole thing with Jeremy Jordan, all that. I mean, that's such an incredible story of your. First question I asked you when I came inside was about your dad. But yeah. 
So do you think you are dealing with all these big personalities? Mm -hmm. Toby McGuire, which is known as being a, you know, there's a lot of words in the dictionary that are not in the dictionary that, you, that they use for Toby. You got DiCaprio, you got Affleck, you got uh, Ben Affleck, you got Alex Wright. These are strong personality people. You're 25. Mm -hmm. how, did you know how, how did you know how to lead and handle people like this? Because I'm sure they're trying to bully you as well to try to control everything. Mm -hmm. How did that relationship take place? A large part of it, I think, was instinctual. Um, through these games, through these experiences, I realized what I was actually good at, and I hadn't really known that um, up until this point. I, um, you know, I guess my, uh, I, I have a higher EQ than probably, you know, like IQ. Like, I, I have a really um, well-honed EQ, and I also um, came at it from a place of trying to understand humans instead of just running a game and being procedural about it and sort of, you know, just trying to run it like in this very procedural way. I, I tried to really understand people and what I saw so often is when all these negative manifestations of personality emerges that what's behind it. Yeah. You're watching this. Yeah. What's behind it is fear. You know, it's fear and it's fear because they just lost a lot of money. Uh, fear because they have a rivalry with someone and so I realized that if I could try to Reduce that fear in them that I could try to make them feel safe or try to you know um, That that was generally the best way to deal with people particularly like when they would lose a, a lot of money um, You know instead of going at them and being like I need you to write that check right now Which is what a lot of people do just giving people the space, you know, just be like, you know, call me when you want and um, You'll just come back and win as much, if not more, next time. What are some of the craziest things you saw happening with this? Oh, you know, personality-wise, was it just regular personality? Was it conversations where they fairly open with one another? Somebody's uh, throwing a comment that Ben about J Lo, or what? What was that part? Yeah, of? I mean, to tell you the truth, um, I was really focused on trying to preemptively squash any drama before it happened. You know. Um, and so, like, I, I was really uh, focused on that, but I have to give it to these guys for the amount of money that was being gambled and, you know, sort of the personalities, they were really civil with each other. There was never a physical altercation. Um, there was a lot of uh, sort of um, getting angry and stomping out, you know, but in terms of, of people uh, fighting with each other or physical altercations or whatever, like, they really kept it pretty civil. Interesting. Yeah. It was was Toby's Toby's personality the way that it's you know presented in the movie was it fairly as accurate as it is, is it is in the movie? Well, Aaron would would really want me to say that the the character char player X is a composite character. Mm -hmm. And he's a character that um, Aaron wrote based on lots of different stories that um, you know I, I told him. Um, there's a character in the book that's player left, player right. That's Toby. Yeah. And um, he was difficult. He was very difficult. He wanted to control and manage the situation. He wanted to make sure he had edge um, in different ways. You know, um, he wanted to be the only player at the table that locked it down and that was tight. And he wanted everyone else to be giving action and gambling. And he, you know, he he put a couple players in, and he was doing all the stuff that um, in order to gain edge. And I shut it down, and he didn't like that. He didn't like you doing no, it. Now, let me ask that. you, how old was he at the time? Because he's got to be similar he's age to you as well. He's similar age to me. I think he's like two years older than I am. Or so it's not like he's a 40-year-old guy trying to, you know. No. And was he already the no. guy, was he already a, a yeah. he was already? Yeah, yeah. Okay. He was like at, at the height of his sort of fame and, and career. and You know, he's really smart. Like, I have to give it to him. He's ext I really... He's extremely bright, and he also knew how to leverage that fame and that and that position to gain power. And, and so, so do you think a part of why you had a very e easy time, let's just say, not easy time, but a, a, more than an easy time than an average person would uh, in an environment like this, because you had a father that was very tough, yeah. you think that helped out a lot? I think having a father that was really tough and that from a very young age um, taught me to overcome fear. I got real comfortable with risk. You know? Early on. Yeah, because we weren't allowed to have fear. So what would, how would he shape your mind to not have any fear? Uh, if I was afraid of something, he would force me to do it. 
you know, like mobile skiing. Uh, I remember he put me in the water to learn how to get up on one ski and I was in that water till I got up, you know. It was a lot of like teaching me how to suffer constructively in, in the face of trying to accomplish something. It was a lot of like standing on top of a cliff on my skis, being this big and being like, you're going to conquer your fear right now, you're going to jump off that cliff, you know. You're kidding me. No. <laughs> wow. So, so was he like that with all of you, with you, Jeremy, and oh, Jordan? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, we don't. My brothers and I learned we had to, from a, from an early age, conquer our fears. And it was never in an unsafe context. And um, I'm really, you know, listen, like, my dad's gotten some crap um, because of the character that is portrayed by Costner. Um, but I'm glad that my dad did that. And he was harder on me because... Wow, you're saying that now. Yeah. I mean, maybe it, it took me... Taking me 39 years. Have you told him that? Have you told oh, him? Yeah, yeah, we've processed. We've yeah. done a lot of healing. Um, but, um, you know, he also said to me, Look, I'm a psychologist. I know what the world looks like, and I particularly know that it's harder for, for women, and I wanted you to be tough. I wanted you to be formidable. He said that. Yeah, but he didn't tell me that growing up, so I just thought he didn't like me as much as my brothers. Wow. You know? So that, because you, you, know, you know, the most emotional part of the movie is. Mm -hmm the part where you know it's at the end of the movie you're sitting there with your dad and you know you're going back and forth you're talking and he asks you he says go ahead molly ask me the question you've been meaning to ask me it, it, you know i know the movie was that one scene but tell me how it was in real life when that happened yeah well um it was on it was in california um we hadn't spoken for a year when i got arrested by the fbi my dad got mad at me it's understandable, little brother. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a valid. How He's could you be mad at me, Dad? But I was just like, what? I mean, I'm scared. I mean, my dad, but he was mad, and it's understandable. He warned me. He told me I was being reckless. He wrote me five-page letters, you know, and and when I got federally indicted, he was pissed. And so he said, get a public defender because he was mad, mm -hmm. and I didn't have any money because the feds had already seized my mm. assets, and. So I didn't speak to him for a year, and then he, he wrote me a letter and he said, I'm coming to California because whether you want to speak to me or not, I'm your father, you're getting sentenced in federal court, and I want to talk to you. He's reaching out to you, you're not responding. Right. So oh, I responded after that. So he comes. So he comes, and um, you know, I, I always wanted my dad to be proud of me, and I always felt like I fell short of my brothers, and, and yeah. I don't really think I'd ever gotten real with him. You know, I, I just, I wanted to be tough and I wanted to be what I thought he you know, wanted me to be. And then, you know, in my early 20s with this game, I just broke from all of that. I just rebelled against all of that. And I was like, you know what? He wanted me to make money. I'm making money, you know? And um, so we sat down and I think for the first time in my life, we got real. And I, I said to him, why didn't you like me as much as my brothers? Other than the fact that I was a brat. You were a brat? <laughs> I was a brat. Yeah. Somehow I believe that. I I, I didn't, you know, I, I was a teenager, I was Brad, and I was, um, you know, I was over-rebelling against the, the, the norms and, and the, you know, situation. Always having an answer over rebel. Yeah, Is that why he said go be an attorney? Yeah. He was like, you like to read and argue, so you should be an attorney. Um, so, you know, then we had that real come to Jesus, and he was emotional. You know, he, Is that the first time? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the first time, it was the first time I got real with him, and I, I asked him point blank, like, why didn't you like me? And, um, you know, he got so emotional, he was like, I didn't like you, I, I love you, you know? And I, I wanted you to be okay in the world. You know, I know how hard the world is, and I wanted you to be formidable. And so from that moment moving forward, it was... I mean, he's my best friend. I speak to him five times a day. He's probably sick of me calling him. Really? Yeah. Today, best friend. Best friend. And you couldn't have said that prior to that? No. He was like my worst enemy. Wow. <laughs> best Not my friend. Worst enemy, but That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Now, let me ask you, what role did Jeremy and Jordan play? I mean, so, so why don't you, you know, so for some people that don't know, what, what do your brothers do? So Jeremy was um, a six-time world champion, and I might get some of his stats wrong, but uh, two-time Olympian. Um, he went straight from the Turin Olympics, where he was ranked number one in the world, to the, the NFL Combine. Got drafted fifth round to the Eagles. 
um, played in the NFL. Oh, that's why you posted it when the Eagles won. You posted Eagles. I said, Eagles, what does this have to do with anything? I was trying to figure that out. Yeah. Okay, this yeah, makes yeah, sense yeah. now. Mm -hmm. You said, I remember this phone call or something yeah, like cause that? Yeah, because it was, it was uh, when Jeremy got a call from Andy Reid. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then, you know, he left the world of sports and started a charity and tech. And, I mean, he's just, he's, in, he's extraordinary. And then Jordan is a Harvard-educated cardiothoracic surgeon. And, you know, he was, like, winning, beating my dad at chess at, like, five. And I'm just sitting there going, at five? He was, a, you know, they were both prodigies, truly. And I'm like, I don't, I like to read poetry. Like, I didn't know what I wanted to do, you know, and I, I didn't have this, these skills that presented. And, um, but I had the competitiveness and I had the just needing approval, like I needed air. And so it was a really kind of bad combination. And, and my brothers are extraordinary human beings, they're great brothers, but what they did is they raised this bar so high that when I went into the world and I, and I stumbled into this mm -hmm. opportunity, I was like, this is, this is my chance to be significant. And maybe it's not as flashy or mm -hmm. shiny or whatever as my brothers, but like, this is a, this may be my only chance. That's what I thought, you know, because you're in your early twenties and you think if you haven't figured it out by twenty-two, you're never you're gonna done. figure yes. it out. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I honestly think twenty-two is the oldest I've ever thought. <laughs> Did they know how hot? Like, did they know what you were doing or not really? They didn't know. Like, yeah, no, they. I mean, you know, I gave while them, you were doing it. Did yeah, they kind of have an idea. Yeah, for sure. And I gave them a PG thirteen. By the way, your mom and dad, did they only have three kids? Yes. Same mom and dad. Yes. You know who Big Brown is? Big Brown was a horse that raced in uh, a Kentucky Derby. Okay. So they went and they were selling his stat fees for $400,000 per, okay? <laughs> Somebody <laughs> should go to your mom and dad and say, listen, I will pay a hundred grand, let's freeze this damn thing and put it yeah. away and let's see what we can come up with because three kids to do that at that yeah. level? Yeah. You know, your yeah. brother's winning in chess at five years old. Yeah. You're, that's insanity to yeah. think that. No, <clears> so. If you if you if your mom and dad see this, hey, props, <laughs> uh, you know, props. We we are cheering you on for that. But so go back to what you were doing, East Coast, West Coast. Mm -hmm. East Coast, it sounds like you got into the Russian community, and it was. Uh -huh. So what was the biggest difference you doing West Coast audience, East Coast audience? Um, West Coast, it was a smaller game. It was a. Fi no, it was still huge. It was still a monster. It was a fifty thousand dollar buy in, no limit game, and people were winning and losing high six figures, a million dollars for sure. Um, East Coast, two hundred fifty thousand, and um, no limit PLO, no limit Omaha, no limit Texas Hold'em. People are win winning and losing five to ten million. You know, um, these are these are Wall Street guys. They they move in units, right? And it's like they're just so used to the fluctuations. Was it always cash or was it Lena? Listen, I don't have cash. I'll throw my Lambo in there. I'll throw my no, well. I'll throw my uh, condo in here. Was I like I that or never got to that point? I didn't want to deal with property. No, yeah, I was it, gonna say it was, some <laughs> No, it was um, it was bank wires and checks. Okay. And, yeah. Um, very rarely cash anymore because it just the amounts were so high. <laughs> so here's my question for you before we talk about the FBI felony, yeah. all that other stuff, right? So, I mean, well, I mean, it was legal for uh, in in LA. It was completely legal to do that. Yeah. Okay. Got and it. what so I was that, doing was legal too, um, because I wasn't taking a break. I was just operating on tips. That's the biggest challenge when that happens is when things change, right? When yes. there's a rake being taken. And I had retained criminal attorneys from both coasts that were former federal prosecutors, and I was paying my taxes, and I was walking for a long time that gray line, and then I remember the exact moment where I made that choice to step over here. Do you remember like, like oh, I, I could tell you what it smelled like in the room. I could tell, I mean, When yes. you did it, did you say, shit, I shouldn't have done this? Or did you do it saying, oh, let's roll the dice? I had that, uh, I just, like that, that scary yeah. feeling. And then it was just like, whatever, I'll handle it. You know, but like, yeah, yeah. I knew it in the pit yeah. of my stomach. Um, you know, I was just, I was, I wanted, I wanted more. I wanted to scale it more. I wanted the games to be bigger. I wanted the games to be, uh, you know, I wanted to move it to Europe. I wanted more, more, more. And I, Vision, expansion. I just wanted expansion, <laughs> but it wasn't the world, you know, it wasn't sustainable. It was just me. I didn't have any financial partners. Right. Um, so I'm extending this crazy credit every week. I'm running seven games a week. 
So you, you didn't think there was any limits. You're like, I'm going to push a little bit more yeah, and a little yeah, bit more yeah, and a little bit more. Yeah. So let's go back to what you were talking about the moment you know you crossed the line. So you yeah. did that. Then what happened after that? So things started to fall apart pretty quickly. Um, how, how quick is quickly? So I would say from the time I took a rake to the time that I was completely shut down, it was probably six months. So six months? It yeah. still lasted six months. Um, yeah. So around the same time that I started taking a rake, I had let these Russian guys start to play. And there's a lot of people that... This is New York. This is New York. That said, didn't you know they are a Russian mob? No. The answer was absolutely not. I mean, they showed up. They were well-dressed. They had a serious story that I had vetted out in terms of what their business mm -hmm, was. Mm -hmm. They were well-spoken, educated. They could mesh well with the players. They just gave a ton of action. Turns out they were running this $100 million insurance fraud scheme, the biggest in New York City history, and the feds are onto them. Mm -hmm. The feds are wiretapping them, mm -hmm. right? So, and simultaneously, you know. The like, feds are wiretapping them. Mm -hmm. So, simultaneously, you got the Ponzi scheme happening. That gets revealed with Ruderman, with Ruderman mm -hmm. in California. So, now they're the feds in here and here. East Coast, West Coast. And, you know, through these wiretaps and through this. Uh, through, through the discovery, mm -hmm. they're like, oh my god, here's this girl, she's got these Russians playing, she's got Wall Street guys playing, and you know how much the Southern mm -hmm. District loves a Wall Street mm -hmm. takedown, you mm -hmm. know? Um, and then the, the West Coast guys, the celebrity factor, and it's all connected through this poker game. Like, it's obvious, it's dangerous, but like, in my heart of hearts, I don't think I was ready to walk away. Which is a crazy moment mm. of, of all of a sudden now you're putting this money and this greed and this power over life and liberty, right? Because I'm breaking the law and now my life's in jeopardy mm. and I'm still choosing to go down this path. And I look at the newspaper about 10 days later, 125 guys really arrested in the biggest mob related takedown in New York City history. Never heard from them again. 125. They had, to, they had to like rent out a gymnasium for processing. Like a month or two later, I get a call from one of my dealers at one of my smaller games. Um, you know, don't come here, the FBI's here. So I throw all my stuff in a suitcase and I'm on the phone with my travel agent and I'm like, I need to book a flight. I need to go home. <laughs> I want my mom. And um, she's like, your credit card's getting declined. Or your card's getting declined. And I, Looked at my balances and they were all they all read negative nine million nine hundred ninety nine thousand ninety nine dollars. So all of my accounts were shut down and seized. So that was game over, you know. So I went I moved home with my mom. I didn't have a bank account. I started writing this book. I tried to battle back. All the games are shut at this point. Two years later, I would kind of started to really make headway in putting my life back together. I had moved back to LA. I'd gotten a job. Um, I had almost finished my book and I was starting to pitch to Hollywood and 10 days after moving back to LA, 17 FBI agents, machine guns, high beam flashlights arrest me and that was when they, they federally indicted me. This is while you're pitching your story? Yeah. I'm like, well, I guess it's a better story now. <laughs> Okay, so this happens now. You're mm -hmm. being indicted. What happened next? I was thrown into a Russian mob RICO indictment. The guy at the top of the indictment was this guy known as RICO the, indictment. Yes, was this guy known as a vor. And a vor in Russian organized crime is the scariest, like most dangerous human being. And he's in Moscow. And I'm like, I don't know the vor. <laughs> like I don't know these they people. They linked you to them. Yes. It said ninety. I said I was looking at ninety years on the press release. I mean, it was gnarly. Moly. 90 years. Yeah, 90 years. Looking at 90 years on the press release. And I flew to New York and I interviewed 10 attorneys that day, that next day. And every one of them said, you don't have any money? I'm like, we can't. My last meeting of the day, I met Jim Walden and he was a Gibson Dunn. He was a former federal prosecutor. And I told him my story and he's like, you need representation. And I would have never indicted this case. And like, I need to make sure that you're okay. So I walked into that courtroom the next day with all these <laughs> Russian mobsters and some gamblers and um, you know it was just it was pretty surreal. That's crazy. What, what was the biggest thing afterwards? Once everything was finalized, mm -hmm. what was the biggest thing that changed with you afterwards? I, I mean I think everything changed. The truth is is that fundamentally nothing really changed inside. And so knowing that and knowing that that was the case um, 
and also being decimated and publicly decimated, you know, was liberating to some degree. I'd face, I was, you know, I, I'd face my biggest fear. I was completely, um, I had failed on a huge level and I was still alive, <laughs> you know, I was still breathing. Mm, so I started building myself, my self-worth and sort of um, from the inside, you know, mm -hmm. and a lot of that was like showing up for my family again and like being of service or making my life about something bigger than myself. Now my drive is, is I still, I'm still ambitious and I still have a drive, but like my picture of success and my motivation for success looks very different. That's interesting. That's great to hear. And then last but not least, you watch the movie. What's your reaction when you watch the movie? It is your story. I mean, obviously she did a phenomenal she job did. representing you. She did. Well, I came, I came at this from a place of, okay, I'm going to, you know, I know that this is a long shot, but I think the best shot for coming out of this massive mess that I've created, um, both financial and reputation and, and, you know, now coming trying to navigate life as a felon was to tell my story and to tell it in the biggest way possible. So I was coming to this movie with such an overwhelming sense of gratitude. It wasn't like someone decided to write a movie mm -hmm. about my life mm -hmm. and like I was going to have to watch it, you know? I knew that, that Sorkin and Jessica and Idris Elba and the producers had taken, you know, had, had, were invested and that it, and it wasn't just a movie, it was a second chance. So. Um, I was already in a, but in a lot of gratitude, and then when I saw the movie, I was just like, just blown away, you know? Well, I, I can tell you that's exactly how I felt when I watched it. <laughs> that's why I reached out to you. So for me, it's hands down the best movie I've seen in the last, last year. I mean, oh, I don't think anything comes close to it. I was so blown away by this story, and I'll just sit with you and hear it from you. Uh, thank you so much thank for you. taking the time and visiting with yeah, us. Yeah, thanks for Thank coming. you. Yes, okay. definitely. <laughs>